space casket. I sit, hand halfway to my mouth, and notice a hum in the room. I am supported by a plastic chair padded with foam, covered in vinyl, detailed with designs that are simple to wipe clean. I am as if a photograph has come alive, and the figure in it wakes to sentience in the middle of life, wandering. The room doesn't hum, but machinery in the room hums. A huge window breaks up the wall, and through it I see darkness and stars, a million stars, maybe more. Papillon butterflies of plasma, crisp like someone poked through black paper with diamond pins. My hand nears my mouth, my mouth is numb, my lips dull with the anaesthetic of the amniotic capsule still, and the flesh on my face feels cold. At first I do not know I am someone, but then who am I? I am, and the answer trails, evades memory, or more truly, imagination. From the idea that I am someone, I imagine myself into existence. Then where am I? I frown, though surely this is an easier question. I imagine, or do I remember? I am in a spacecraft. I look around at the thing in itself, banal and real and actual, phenomenal, not noumenal. Benches and walls and gleaming machines, but details of this elude me, slipping ever further from grasp like a bar of wet soap from wet fingers. How memories are chained, one triggering another. I remember a bathroom. This is memory, not creation of mind, though memory works like a painter behind the scenes. But I am here, not there. Not in memorial memorizing, memorate memorable memories, real. Knowledge crystallizes, feels actual, and the parts fall in place like a child's model. Yes, I am in a spaceship. That explains the stars, and I am Malcolm Armstrong, and I am an astronaut. Knowing rushes like a foaming tide, and my identity is afloat on it. I now know everything, who I am, where I am, everything except what I'm doing here in this room, in this spaceship. I don't remember getting here, either into the room or into the ship. I remember the casket and its dripping, iridescent life fluid. Then I remember the firing, the fire, the firmament, ascending into space on a great engine. I last remember... what? Sleep and cold and dream, so long it was that I dreamt, my mind wandering in shadows. An Odysseus from island to island of images, and then the void and emptiness of the world before creation. The mind, the dream, the void, tangling my thoughts like briars. I need to get up. I need to get moving. Something's wrong. I remember the fronds and leaves of the woods of earth, places out of memory where I am no longer. Everything remembered is imaginary and is forgotten and leaks out of mind once more. A pause. I look around the room. I have the sense that I should be frightened, but fear is distant, like an alarm ringing in a building three blocks away. I raise my hands to look at them. I'm cold and wet, and a trail of ice water leads to the door, but the door is closed. From the way the water has drained and the pieces of ice melting in it, I suspect I came in here and the door closed after me. If that is so, then I don't remember walking. Can I still walk? I was asleep for a long time, perhaps centuries. All that time I was gone, I was not gone. I do not sense an absence or a break in my existence. I existed even though I slept through the gloom of interstellar space for decade over decade, always unaware of myself. Yet I did not cease. 
I was there, though I knew it not. Shake free, Malcolm, my lad. The alarm of fear rings still, but I don't have enough adrenaline to pay it heed. They told us our mission would last centuries and the machines would keep us alive until it was time for us to wake and descend and populate the planet selected, Medusa. But I was awake now, and it seemed too early for waking. I stood, and some rations fell from my hand. I suspected I had been eating, but what? I do not recollect. I remembered now the eating, but though I saw the rations on the clean floor, square, sweet, brown, chocolate-like food, I did not stoop to pick them up. My mind is slow. It moves like glaciers, huge and broken and breaking. Food and water and colony planets. We were to be colonists, but I cannot prioritize. I stood and walked to the window, forgetting why I'd gone until the touch of my fingers on the neo-diamond plate that separated me from the void reminded me of Medusa. Which part of the sensation belongs to the window, and which to my fingers? I looked out for Medusa. I remembered the images, green and blue, another earth, this Medusa. And we were to be the first. But as much as I searched, she was not there. The craft spun slowly, so I waited. I would view a full circle of space, and in time she would rise. Minutes turned, but there was no Medusa. I tipped back my head and said, Alexa! That one always listened, always, anyway, when we'd all been awake. Alexa was an automind, named from some lustrous predecessor of autominds, perfect in and of herself storing all humanity's knowledge in electric nanospheres. Humankind's memory was not in humans now, it was in machines. I called out, but Alexa did not reply. I remembered her velvet tones, composited female for those who preferred such things, male, if otherwise, and also androgynous for those who had no interest in either. I cleared my throat and called again in case she had not heard, but she always heard. Hearing was part of her function. There is a blank. I'm next, standing by my casket. The formed crystal canopy is open, more neodiamond, coloured amethyst and aquamarine. My umbilicals uncoiled, torn free and leaking glittering life fluid into the box that held my sleep and now contained my absence. Fingertips outstretched, I see I have no fingertips. Time has erased my identity. I touch the canopy and feel its chill. Frozen still, it has not been open long enough to thaw completely. On either side of the room, like the shelves of a family mausoleum, lie the caskets of my crew, translucent with frost, and I know they dream inside like I dreamed. My name is on the casket side here. Malcolm Armstrong. That is who I grew up to be. I remember a childhood and school and friends and flying above Australia and a dog called Jasper. I remember grief. I am not concerned if I never become Malcolm Armstrong again. All this time has worn him out. I scratch my arm. There is a badge of rank on the sleep suit I still wear. I am the captain. Am I the captain? I rub my eyes. I am not sleepy, and perhaps I shall never sleep again, but I have to plumb the mystery of why I am awake, still short of our mission to Medusa. Alexa, I call, yet this time not expecting an answer. I will seek help from the bridge. I know where the ship's bridge is and walk toward it on legs weakened from lying down for long years. Even with the inline auto massages and the electrical fields that stimulate muscle tone, I pass another open casket. On that is a name, Rebecca Schwartz. She was the captain, not me. 
Memory and imagination are confused again. Her casket is of ambient temperature and there is no ice meltwater around it. It seems she has been awake longer than I have been. I must find her. She must know why we have woken so early with no Medusa in sight. I guess I will find her on the bridge because that is where captains are found. The tin corridor is long and tubular, with diamond windows showing stars, a great panoply, the heraldic arms of heaven. So many stars. It is not cold in the corridor, and I'm thinking about something I can't remember when the voice speaks. The voice is not Alexa. I can't see Captain Schwartz, so I do not imagine it's her. It's a strange voice, unlike any I have ever heard before. This voice is the sound of pattering on the space side of the metal tube. But what could be outside in interstellar space? Then I realize it is not a voice. What kind of voice speaks with the cold pushing of fingers into my brain? A voice that whispers things that will be heard. I realize I've never known where my thoughts come from. They just appear in my mind. Who knows who is the true author of them? Then come pictures in my mind. I don't seem to be responsible for them at all. I don't make them. Who does? That sound again, the one I had mistaken for a voice, but this time it's inside the ship, behind me. I stop. It's so hard to think here. I turn. It's difficult to remember what I should be frightened of. I notice my heart is beating fast and my palms are sweaty and my mouth is dry, so I must be anxious. Realizing that I'm anxious, I run along the corridor and the sound is behind me. I pass through a door that opened in anticipation of my coming with a slow hiss. This capsule is an entertainment room. I remember that. Though this is not entertaining. The screens are dreaming their own blank-faced void dreams on faces of neo-quartz. Everyone is switched off. I become aware of something behind me, and with wondering gaze, turn. Through the windows I see that something has caught the ship and wrapped round it like a spider bundling a fly. Though this is not a spider, this is an origin. Another thought from nowhere. What does that word mean? An origin? It was announced in my head like a proper name. It is a name that belongs to something. And then an explanation. It means that this is where my thoughts come from. And it's wrapped half around the ship and I can see its flabby fingers and a flabby tongue like a succulent plant, all flesh and plump. The origin is inside the ship too. I'm anxious again, or perhaps I never stopped being anxious and hadn't noticed. I run from the entertainment capsule and along another corridor and my feet boom and I hear the pitter-patter of its interstellar fingers outside the metal skin of the spaceship. And the origin is behind me too, running like hallucinations in waves and shadows of ruby and emerald. I scream, I flee, I stumble, I fall. The door of the bridge opens, and there is Captain Schwartz, seated in her captain's seat, but she is wired up. Similes fail and metaphors fall adrift like cables that miss their mooring. Schwartz is not cabled up, though that's the closest I can get to it. It's like a Bronze Age man considering a computer. How could he possibly make sense of what he was seeing? He would see things, certainly, but not know them and in his struggle to understand them, he would compare them to things that were familiar to him. Axes, adzes, golden talks. And so I do the same. I call the things that infiltrate cables, and those that run into her head, wires, and ribbons, and tendrils, and strings. I see, but cannot differentiate which organs they penetrate and suck. I shake my head. She's not cabled. She's not wired. Those green snakes are not briars. They are drinking her, and the closest I can get is siphons, except they do not siphon life from her, they deliver it. They live her. 
Schwartz was now identical to the origin. She came from it. I hear it moving. I turn my hand halfway to my mouth. I see I am cabled. I am plumbed in. I am hardwired to the murmuring, pattering network. It is not one thing, I see now, or, or rather it is one thing, but is in many places as if separate. And now it stands behind me, reaching this origin. It is a beetle. But it is not a creature, it is not a beetle, it is not a person like us. Perhaps it is a phallus. We shouldn't have come here. This is not our place. Schwartz's mind opens into mine through the cable that runs into my leg and into my veins and into my central nervous system until it populates and postulates and palpates and flowers into my brain, making new life, new places, new cities in my mind. It seems we were not the only colonists. Schwartz whispers to me, two years ago, our Nova Drive failed and we drifted in space. I am full of images that are not mine. The shining trapezohedron, a whisper, a mineral. I crystallize out as if from a supersaturated solution. Schwartz whispers to me, this is your captain speaking. Your captain is dead. The origin holds me. The tendril tentatively feels its way down my throat now. The soft tongue is in my ear. My brain is now run riot with an alien fungus, the plastic fragment of a child's toy, a pair of broken shades lying on the tarmac, the long past that had led to now, and never, 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 we are not the only colonists. I sit, hand halfway to my mouth. A plastic chair padded with foam covered in vinyl that is easy to wipe clean supports me seated in a small room that hums. After ten seconds, I know who I am, but I do not know why I am here, in the spacecraft's galley. I am Melissa Kirali, colony agronomist. I stand and the sleep slime drips from me. How I hate its iridescence. I have not been long awake then, but where is Medusa? We should only wake when we are close and preparing for descent to our colony world. I need to find Captain Schwartz. If she is awake, she will be found on the bridge. I go there. The door opens. When I stand, the floor is dry around my feet. How long then have I sat here in the galley? Captain Schwartz will know why we are awake. I will find her. I hurry along the tubular corridor that leads from the galley to an entertainment capsule. I remember there is another corridor from there to the bridge. But when I enter the corridor, I notice that something has attached to me. I don't know what it is. A siphon? A weed? A ribbon? Have I caught my sleeve on a nail and unraveled? My thoughts are slow, puffing like a sea anemone. The fingers shuffle inside me. My mouth feels dry, my fingers stiff, and then... The origin holds me. The tendril tentatively feels its way down my throat now. The soft tongue is in my ear. The plastic fragment of a child's toy. We are not the only colonists.